Greetings viewers, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, we are talking about the Subaru Sandbar. I've had it for over a year, been basically daily driving it, if not at least once a week driving it. So we're gonna talk about all the things I like about it, all the things I don't like about it, and what you should know before you import or buy one of these little pickup. That said, let's get on with the show. So first and foremost, if you're thinking about importing or purchasing a sandbar truck or van, uh, federally, as long as it's older than 25 years old, you've got the green light. Mine's a 1994 model. This year you can import a 95 model. Uh, that's the newest imported vehicle you can get and not have to worry about any kind of legal issues as far as the federal government is concerned. Uh, these are not outlawed per se in any individual state or municipality, but you need to know your local state laws on these things because some states outright say off-road use only. Some let you use them as an LSV or a low speed vehicle, which caps them at like 35 mile per hour, similarly to like a golf cart that you'd ride around on vacation at the beach or in your neighborhood if you have a tag or insurance on it. And some states like South Carolina, which where I'm at is the wild, wild west. We don't do emissions testing. We don't do annual inspections. And uh, you can drive one of these things on the highway unrestricted which is great. So if you're planning to buy one of these little boogers and you wanna have it for own road use, make sure that you legally can do so in your state. So you've already decided that you're good to go on what you want, the age of what you want, either truck or van, supercharged or carbureted, all the options. You either have found someone that's imported a one already and is selling it here in the United States or you found an importer. Now I'm not gonna get into all of the logistics of buying these in Japan and having them to the US because honestly, I don't know everything that's involved in that. Uh, so if you got questions on that, do a little bit more due diligence on yourself. Luckily, I have had an importer to import these vehicles for me and bought them once they were in the United States. So I got a lot of steps skipped. For those of you familiar with the channel, you know that this is not my first sandbar. This is actually my second. Uh, my first sandbar was a 1994 JA, which is a Japanese agriculture base, base model farm vehicle, you know, stripped out mobile. And uh, it had about 80,000 kilometers on it when I sold it. This is a 1994 Super Deluxe sandbar, which is a higher level trim and has factory air conditioning. Both of the vehicles are equipped with a 658cc inline four-cylinder engine. I know a lot of you Subaru fans might be saying, what, it doesn't have a boxer engine? It's an inline four, well, what gives? Well, it's part of being a K car, uh, which is the classification for compact small cars in Japan, uh, cars and trucks uh, that are capped at 660ccs on their engine displacement. So we're gonna steer clear of the history of K cars in this video, cause that's not what it's about. So yes, this is a naturally aspirated carbureted 658cc inline four cylinder. It makes 40 horsepower and 40 foot pounds of torque. You might be thinking, well, who in their right mind want to drive something this small and that underpowered on American roadways? Well, you gotta be a little bit crazy to own one of these things and put it on the road in the United States. So for you that are rolling your eyes right now with that 40 horsepower and 40 foot pounds of torque and a carburetor, there is another option for you. It's a little bit harder to find, especially in the trucks. It was more prevalent in the vans, uh, but they did have a fuel injected supercharged version of this engine, uh, which if uh, memory serves correctly, was about 52 horsepower and 55 foot pounds of torque, or it might be 55 horsepower and 58 foot pounds of torque. I know it's in that general area, but it's more than the 40, 40 out of the carbed engine. So if you want a little bit more zoom zoom, look for the supercharged engine, but you're gonna pay more if you find one with that supercharged engine. Uh, these aren't terribly slow though. A lot of people look at me funny when I tell them the power it makes and the size of the engine. It's basically a motorcycle engine at 658 cc's, pretty much in line with a Yamaha R6 motorcycle. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't make the power of that motorcycle, but power to weight ratio, these are fairly light vehicles, so you really don't notice that much. I haven't really had any trouble keeping up with normal traffic in the city or on the highway. Um, it accelerates between what a normal car and an 18-wheeler that's loaded accelerate. So 
you're not going to win any drag races, but you're not going to be, you know, out there flintstoning it faster than the engine will propel it. There are two options for transmission in these vehicles. You've got a manual transmission and you've got an electronic CVT spring for the manual transmission. You get more usable power out of the engine. You stay in the power band longer and you don't have as many issues. The old eCVT that was in these, uh, they're a little fragile. Uh, they're a little wasteful on power transfer and like everything with this vehicle, uh, you can't really go to your local Subaru dealership or parts house to get parts for it. Back to the size of this and uh, your safety on American highways. I'm six foot four and about 195 pounds. As you can see, this is an extremely tiny little truck. The van is no larger. It basically is the same dimensions until here and back, Sam Lemp is the bed. These trucks are extremely light for Highway use, I believe the curb weight is right about 2,000 pounds, give or take. Um, there are no crumple zones. Your legs will be the crumple zones. This front bumper is literally the footwell where the pedals are and where my toes rest. There are no airbags. There are seat belts, three-point seat belts. There's no anti-lock brakes. There's no anything. You get hit in this, you're gonna get hurt more than likely injured very severely or killed at highway speeds. And uh, that's kind of the risk you gotta take with this. It's not really any different than someone riding a motorcycle. I hear people all the time say, oh, you better hope you don't get hit in that thing. You'll be dead. They'll be scraping you off the highway. It's no different than if I was on a Harley Davidson or a sport bike. If someone decided to hit me on a motorcycle, I'd be just as dead as this, but at least you do have a exoskeleton of metal in a little K vehicle compared to a motorcycle. So yeah, there is an element of danger with these when you operate them in the US on public roads. There's a danger anytime you get behind the wheel of any vehicle, but keep that in mind. So we talk about it being small, and as I said before, I'm 6'4 and 195. Do I fit in this? And the answer is a resounding yes. I've been driving it for over a year, so I'd hope I fit in it, but uh, surprisingly, these have a lot of room in them. They might not look like it, but they are fairly comfortable. Uh, one reason why I picked the Subaru over the other K trucks out there, like the Honda Acti, Suzuki Carry, uh, Daihatsu Hi Jet, there's basically one for every Japanese manufacturer, is one, I'm a Subaru guy. Two, they've got the most room in the cab. Three, the engine is rear mounted, so you don't have all that heat like the cab over or the midship mounting engines in the other manufacturers. The sandbar is the only K truck with a four cylinder engine. The rest have three cylinder engines. And the sandbar is the only one, as far as I know, that comes factory supercharged. You can, I believe, get a Daihatsu high jet and a turbo or a Suzuki carry. I can't remember exactly which one, but I believe there was a factory turbo option for one of them. But Either way, the sandbar is basically got the highest top speed, the most power, and the most comfortable ride and handling of the lot. Plus, it's a Subaru, and Subaru guy. So I'm gonna get the Subaru. So a couple of misconceptions about these little trucks. I heard all over from people before I purchased it, and you know, just people that talk about them in general, say, oh, they get 40, 50 miles to the gallon. That's absolutely false. Uh, I have driven this on many EPA runs, or MPG runs, let me say, and the best, absolute best combined city and highway, it's majority highway, but I do do a little bit of city driving, is low 30 MPG. I average normally high 20s, especially with the air conditioning on right now in the summer. So don't go buying this or don't go buy one of these thinking you're going to get 40, 50 miles of the gallon that it's going to be some super gas saver for a daily driver because that's a big old myth. I'd rather say a big bald face lie, but we'll call it a myth. I'm sure there's things you could do to improve the fuel economy of these, but the main hindrance is when you're in fifth gear and you're going 50 to 55 mile an hour, you're turning between 4,500 and 5,000 RPM. That little engine is screaming. It redlines at about 71, 7,200 RPM, but 4,500, 5,000 RPM is quite high. It would be nice if they had a sixth gear for highway speeds, but that's not what they were designed for. 
In Japan, I believe they're capped at 80 kilometers an hour, which equates about 4950 miles per hour. And that's normally where I drive this on the highway here. Uh, my other one, I got up to 90, 100 regularly, but the amount of RPMs it was turning, it's not really worth it to get there five minutes you know, sooner than if I keep it around 80 kilometers on the speedometer. It's a little bit off because of the wheel and tire package I put on here. I use a GPS speedometer for the first month or so to get acclimated to uh, judging my speed with a kilometer cluster. And right about 80 kilometers on the cluster on this truck is about 55 miles per hour adjusted for the size of the tires. And I turned about 4,500 RPM, which seems to be a pretty good sweet spot for the truck. So here I am behind the wheel of the truck. I've got plenty of room to the steering wheel. It's a non-adjustable uh, steering column. I don't believe they had an option for an adjustable steering column. Uh, the reach to the steering wheel is quite comfortable. And I've got miles of headroom. I've got a good six inches of headroom here, although you can't see the top of the cab where my hand is. Uh, but there is an option for a deluxe cab or king cab, and it's got a riser with another four or five inches of headroom, which I don't know why you'd need, uh, other than the optional storage tray that they have that bolts on right where the visors are for you to stow stuff above your head. Now, ride quality on this is a little harsh due to the size of the dampeners, the size of the suspension, uh, the weight and the loading of the truck. Uh, a couple of potholes I've hit in this thing. I thought I broke the truck in half. It is quite violent. It is quite a loud ride as well. Um, I don't really mind it that much. I'm part of a Facebook group that owns these little trucks and vans, and a lot of them add aftermarket sound dampening to them because from the factory they do not have sound dampening uh, just because they try to keep them light and keep the weight out of them so they have the most uh, payload and uh, cargo carrying ability and uh, you know keep them light for the fuel economy. So as far as creature comforts go on this being a super deluxe, super deluxe, uh, basically I've got air conditioning. I've got air conditioning and I've got heat. Uh, my first sandbar, the JA, did not have air conditioning and uh, it was a little bit of a struggle last summer with it when I got it, but uh, it was pretty good with both windows down and the floor vents open. Uh, with the air conditioned model, you don't have the four vents, but you can buy them from Subaru in Japan and install them. They bolt right in. Um, everything is well within reach. I can reach all the way to the passenger door and uh, roll down the window if I need to, with barely having to lean over because everything's within arm's reach. Um, we've got two AC vents in the middle. You have blanks on the sides. I believe only the vans had those vents and ducts. Uh, lots of block off plates because they really didn't have options for fog lights and rear window defrosters and rear wipers like the van did. So that's what that layout is. Uh, as far as I know, all of them just had a speedometer, temperature gauge and fuel gauge. And then you've got some warning lights. Uh, to get the tachometer, I believe you had to have the van version. I've installed an aftermarket tachometer in this one. Uh, there is indicators on the speedometer for your red line in first, second, and third at mile per hour or kilometer per hour uh, markings. You do have a radio. This one is a non-cassette radio. I don't know if a cassette radio was even an option though. Uh, being that this is a Japanese market vehicle, you cannot pick up FM signals in the U.S. with this radio, so you have to put a U.S. radio in it or get a... Um, FM band whip something translator some such there's there's an adapter I know that some of the K trucks have for the Japanese radios to work with US radio waves you get one speaker but you can put two um, glove box is decently large on the non air conditioned model on the air conditioned model like mine it gets much shallower because of the evaporator core you do have a cigarette lighter and an ashtray. Sun visors, which are an option. Your passenger mirror, I believe, is an option. Uh, lots of different options on these. Your grab handles are optional. Neat little thing, the headrests are actually bolted to the back of the cab and straddle the rear window. The seats are adjustable forward and back, but based on my size as an American, I have it all the way back. I don't see who could drive this all the way to the front other than a child. 
So as I said, manual transmission, can't really see the shifter for my leg, but uh, five speed manual, actually a six speed. If you count the extra low crawler gear, push button four wheel drive activated by a red button in the top of the shift handle. Your three point seat belts, much like any other vehicle has. And yes, before you ask in the comments, they are all right hand drive. You cannot get these in left hand drive. They were only made for uh, the Japanese market. So there was no point in them ever making a left hand drive version. Is it difficult to drive a right hand drive vehicle in the US? Uh, not really, I haven't had any issues. There's good visibility out of the cab. Uh, so looking backwards over my shoulder has been fine. Sometimes you gotta think about it coming to corners or turns and angling the truck in a way that you have a line of sight out the back window. Uh, for certain turns. Uh, Drive-throughs, normally I can just reach all the way across if I'm getting food. If I'm going for the ATM, I'll just back into the ATM so I'm closer to it. I get some funny looks, but uh, I always get funny looks when driving this truck. Little pre-warning here, if you don't like attention and don't like talking to strangers, do not buy one of these trucks or vans. Every single time I go to get gas, I'm having a conversation with someone about this truck. Every time I drive it anywhere, I see cell phones hung out of windows, I see people hanging out of windows, I get waves, I get smiles, I get thumbs up, I get all the looks. It's pretty funny. I get more attention in this than I ever did in any of my Corvettes, Camaros, or any other vehicle I've ever owned. So one of the really great things about these trucks is uh, they're trucks, functional trucks, and they do truck work, even though they're tiny and uh, some may argue under power. These trucks have a maximum payload or a maximum safe payload from Subaru of 350 kilograms, which is about 770 pounds. Uh, the bed is four and a half foot wide with the bed sides up and it's about six and a half foot long with the tailgate shut. I have gone to Home Depot many times in this truck. I have gotten lots of sheet goods, plywood, OSB, drywall. With the tailgate down, they fit in perfectly. I can run straps from the tailgate up and X them across the back. These things are super utilitarian and super useful. There are tie down points all down the bedside, all down the side of the chassis. There's tie downs on the little headache rack up here. They're on the tailgate. It is meant to be used for work. It's a fun little runabout, but work is what these were really designed for. And that's what I like to use it for. I have, as many of you know, in other repair videos, I've got a 2004 Sierra 3500 Duramax Dually. And uh, this gets driven 90% of the time and that gets driven about 10% of the time or less now. I actually had to jump start it the other day because the battery was dead. I haven't been driving it because I haven't had a need to. Unless I'm hooked up to a big trailer or I'm towing with the Duramax, I'm driving the sandbar because it does 90% of what I need to do with a truck. Whether it's haul tools around, uh, pick up lumber, Go pick up an engine, as we see in the pictures on the screen. Uh, went and picked up an FA20 in this, no problem. Drove it an hour and a half back with it. Uh, recently went and got some plywood. I've gotten OSB before. You know, as I said a minute ago, I uh, also hauled about 500 pounds of hardwood flooring in the bed of this truck before, and barely any squat in the rear suspension. Well, not technically this truck, but it was my old truck, but still, same difference, same truck, same chassis suspension, and all that good stuff. Uh, but there's a difference in these and your regular pickup truck bed. So your tailgate folds down and is held in place with chains like you expect on any normal pickup in the US, but there's something different. These, the bed sides also fold down. They're also removable, same as the tailgate. They're just kind of like a Jeep Wrangler door. You've got a 10 millimeter headed bolt at the edge of the hinge. You take all three bolts out and you can just slide them off the hinges and you have a full flat bed and it's quite easy to do. Unhook your chains from the tailgate. Subaru conveniently put little bumpers uh, so your tailgate and your bed sides aren't gonna hit the body. You got a latch up here. And a latch over here. Now you have a flat bed. You can take off all three panels or you can do this too. If you've got a load that's not longer than six and a half foot, but is wider than four and a half foot, you can do this combination. Hook your chains back off your tailgate up. 
Now you've got about five feet of width in your bed. If you want to pick it back up easy, pull the tailgate down and your bedside's flip back up. Easy little latch system. And you're good to go. So moving back here to the hood, and this is a hood, not a rear bumper. Um, here's the party piece. Here's the engine. All 658 cc's of fury. So here at the back, we've got our rocker cover. We've got our oil cap. We've got our four spark plug wires, our exhaust manifold, the mid pipe, our muffler assembly, distributor and transmission back behind that. Alternator on top over here, AC compressor behind that, belt, timing belt cover, backup alarm. Everything's pretty easy to access down here, but with the top panel off, you've got way more access and it's super easy to service. So you may be thinking to yourself, uh, one big thing you mentioned earlier about getting parts. How do you get parts for these things? You can't go down to Subaru dealership and pick them up. You can't go to Advance or AutoZone and pick them up. You can't really even buy them online from the normal suspects. So how do you get parts for a Japanese import vehicle? Well, there's two websites I can recommend to have ordered from and used, japanparts.com and amiyama.com. I've done videos in the past about ordering from both, shipping speeds and cost, but that is my main source. Just buy it straight from Japan, cut out any kind of middleman in trying to buy off of eBay or any of these places that pop up and market themselves as selling these and uh, servicing these kinds of K trucks and K cars. It's very easy to get on. Uh, the shipping is a little high because it is from Japan, but if you get together a bulk order of things you're going to need in the future and things you need now, uh, it doesn't hurt that much, but it is still kind of steep. So keep that in mind that, you know, if something breaks, you can't just go down the road and pick up a part. Likely you're gonna be waiting and have this sitting somewhere for a month or more waiting for the part to come in from Japan. So keep that in mind. That uh, is definitely something to consider. So that's basically it. That's basically the runabout of the sandbar. Uh, conclusion, pros. It's super cool and unique. It's gonna get you lots of attention. It's fun to drive. It gets decent enough gas mileage. It's very useful as a truck and as a daily commuter. Cons, you're gonna get lots of attention in it if you're a person that doesn't like attention. It's slow and underpowered, but not terribly so. Uh, it's gonna beat you up if you don't live in an area where you have the smoothest of paved roads. And that's about it. It's hard to find cons with this little booger. Absolutely love it. I've loved driving it. I've loved owning it for the last year and a month, basically. Um, I will not hesitate to buy a air-conditioned supercharged version uh, if one comes available. So viewers, if you want a chance to buy this one from me, I just sold my last one not too long ago to a viewer. Uh, I will be selling this one as well. Like I said, if I can find a supercharged AC, very clean truck. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you next time.